Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials, video 33. This is on genotypes and phenotypes, and how changes in genotype can, can uh, affect changes in the phenotype. Um, you should know what both of those are. Genotypes are going to be the letters of the DNA, or the genes inside you. Phenotype are going to be the physical characteristics that you have. And so uh, an analogy could be the letters that we put in a book is like the genotypes, but the story would be like the phenotype. And so I've written a sentence right here. Uh, which probably means nothing to you. Let's turn to the next page of this text and we'll see that we now can see the word the but still doesn't really mean anything um, to you. But now let's turn to the third page and we can actually see a story starting to emerge. The fat cat ate the rat. And so the letters would be like the genotypes but the phenotype is going to be the story. And so when you look at me what you see is phenotype. You see that I have blue eyes, you see that my nose looks like this, but what you don't see are the letters behind that. Now, if you were really paying attention on those first two pages, you actually could have seen the message there. So let's turn back for just a second. And so uh, this is that first one. Uh, and you, it doesn't make sense when you look at it, and that's because the whole thing has been frame shifted. In other words, if I were to put a letter in right here, the, you'll also see the fat cat ate the uh, rat shows up as well. And so this is a mutation. If we ever have a change in, in here, so this would be a deletion. So we deleted a letter. It shifts everything over one. Uh, or if I were to go to the next one, what kind of a mutation do we have here? Well, um, now we've got the, but now we've added this letter of E. And so we've inserted that. And so if I get rid of that, we can still see that the fat cat ate the rat uh, start to emerge as well. And so changes in the letter have huge implications when it comes to the story. And likewise, in us, changes to the DNA can affect our phenotypes or physically what we look like. Those are played against our environment, and that's called natural selection. And so let me summarize what I'm going to talk about. Genotypes and phenotypes, and mostly how changes in the genotype can affect phenotype. Now, what are genotypes made up of? They're simply made up of DNA. And so how do we change the DNA, or how do we get errors in the DNA? Well, there's essentially two ways that we can do that. The major source of errors comes from damage to the DNA or uh, mistakes in DNA replication. We call those things mutations. They're played against the environment and some of them are actually beneficial. Some of them are harmful and some of them are none of the above. They're neutral. Um, there's other ways that we can get errors in our DNA as well. We can have errors uh, in the cell cycle. So when we're actually making copies of cells or when we're making sex cells, we can have errors in that. That can eventually lead to new uh, phenotypes. Um, which can be good. I'll talk about bread, wheat, and can be bad. I'll talk about a mule. Uh, and it can also lead to human disorders. So a famous one that probably you're familiar with is Down syndrome. And so these are all simply changes in the DNA, but those eventually cause changes in um, the phenotypes. And so let me give you an example of that. One of the most famous ones that we always talk about as biology teachers is sickle cell anemia. And so if you have sickle cell anemia, this would be a regular red blood cell like that. If you have sickle cell anemia, you have a red blood cell that looks like that, or it's this sickle kind of appearance. Now, it leads to a lot of other uh, problems within your body, but it's simply a change in one letter. And how could a change in one letter in the DNA cause this huge uh, change in the uh, blood cell itself? Well, let's think about DNA for just a second. Let me actually clear this off and get a better color. And so DNA has two strands, remember? Um, this top strand is actually be called the non-sense strand or the non-reading strand. And then this bottom one's going to be called the sense or the reading strand. And so if you look right here, uh, there's a G on one side of the DNA. That means there's a C on the other side or there's a complementary strand. And so those three letters will code in messenger RNA. So this would be transcription right here. Code for these three letters over here, which codes for this one amino acid. And so when you're making hemoglobin inside blood, that's how we get this first uh, valine is going to be this first amino acid inside hemoglobin. And if we trace down, as long as the letters stay the same, we're going to have the same amino acids. But if you have sickle cell anemia, you have a mistake right here. You have a mistake in this first amino acid. 
Um, it ends up changing the chemistry of that amino acid, therefore the change it changes the whole structure of the protein and can lead to this sickle cell. And the interesting thing is that that's passed on because that's what you pass on is your DNA to your kids generation after generation. And so that's been passed on and selected for or against. And that's how changes in the letters of the DNA, any kind of mistake in this letter, leads eventually to changes in the amino acids, changes in phenotypes. So how did these mutations come to be? Well, we make mistakes. And so when we're going to copy one strand of DNA and make two, so during the cell cycle when we want a cell to divide, DNA polymerase will make a really perfect copy of that DNA. But occasionally it will make mistakes. And so maybe there's a T over on this side. Instead of making a T, it actually makes a C on this side. And so we can get mistakes just from copying or DNA replication in DNA polymerase. We can also get mutations through um, radiation, uh, be it like gamma radiation or UV radiation, that can cause changes in the letters as well. And we can also get it in chemicals. And so we find if something is a carcinogen, for example, it's a, a cancer-causing agent, um, good example would be like diesel fumes uh, is a carcinogen. But how does it make cells cancerous? It's affecting their DNA and it's making them so they keep reproducing out of control. And so these are all ways that we can get mutations, and there are other ways we can get mutations as well. But these mutations are then played against their environment. And we could group those mutations into three different types. If you've got a neutral mutation, that means we've changed the DNA, but it doesn't affect the organism. Um, how could that be? Well, remember in eukaryotes, a lot of our DNA actually doesn't contain genes. It's areas between the genes. And so uh, neutral mutations are not going to affect the protein, or they're going to affect the protein so little that it really doesn't affect the phenotype. Now, the reason I put a clock down here is that we can actually use these neutral mutations and we can make what's called a biological or an evolutionary clock because mutations will occur at a specific rate and so we can look at how many mutations have arisen we can actually see how long ago it was that two organisms for example shared a common ancestor. We can also have mutations that are then beneficial in other words they help an organism one of my favorite types of beneficial mutations we've really started to study just fairly recently, and that is a mutation in the, so this would be a helper T cell, it's in a protein found in helper T cells. And so uh, it's a deletion, so that's going to be when we're missing a section of that gene. Uh, and if you are normal, you're CCR5, but if you have this mutation, you have a delta 32 mutation or a change in that gene. Why is it beneficial? Well, if you have this gene, or better yet, two copies of this gene, you can't be infected uh, by HIV or human immunodeficiency virus. In other words, there's something different in the structure of that helper T cell so this virus can't gain entry. Um, what's interesting about this is it's most prevalent in Europeans. We don't find it at all in Africans or Asians for the most part. And so that suggests to us that it was selected. And so when scientists started looking, they found that this offered protection against either bubonic plague or smallpox, and now is providing uh, protection for um, descendants of the people that first came up with this mutation. And so it helped them a long time ago and helps them today. So that'd be a beneficial. However, most of the mutations are going to be harmful. Um, harmful to that individual, and, and if it's in the germ cells, harmful to generations that come after that. And I wrote 70% and 7%. What that means is that if the mutation occurs within a gene, 70% of the time that changes within the gene is going to cause a, a harmful mutation. If it's outside the gene, only 7% of the time um, it is. An example of one would be PKU. PKU is a um, inherited disease. It's a recessive disease, so you have to get two copies of it. Um, but if you have pe uh, phenylketonuria, um, and they test all babies for this, you can't break down uh, or you can't do well with a diet that's rich in phenylalanine. And so they have to accommodate for that. They change your diet. And so it's a harmful mutation. And this was discovered just in the last century. And so when we weren't testing for this, babies that were born, their diet actually was killing them a normal diet. So that'd be an example of a harmful mutation. We can also have mistakes not only in the copying or the duplication of DNA, but in the uh, cell cycle. And so what I've drawn right here is meiosis. 
meiosis is how we make sperm and egg. How do we go from a diploid cell eventually to a haploid cell? So you think of this making sperm or making eggs. We can also have mistakes in here. And a lot of these mistakes will actually occur during meiosis one. These chromosomes will fail to separate. And so eventually what you get on this side are, are instead of having ones that are, are haploid, you'll actually have some that could even be uh, 4N or 3N or 2N on this side. Usually when we have sperm or egg that have the wrong number of chromosomes, that leads to uh, a, a uh, zygote that just doesn't go anywhere um, or it's not viable. But sometimes it can lead to a new species. And so bread, uh, wheat, or the wheat that we use to make bread, um, some, some of that wheat is actually uh, tetraploid or hexaploid. They've got extra sets of chromosome, and that can actually lead to vigor. Uh, in plants, a, a large number of plants are actually made through mus mistakes in the DNA, uh, mistakes in the cell cycle. It can also lead to sterility. And so you probably know that a, a mule is uh, when you have a female donkey and a male horse. Um, and they're sterile. And the reason why is that a male horse is going to have 64 chromosomes. A donkey is going to have 62 chromosomes. And so a mule is going to have 63 or an odd number of chromosomes. It's hard for them to make a viable sperm or egg. I think there has been one case of a female, a, a few cases of female mules actually giving birth to foals, but it's really, really rare. And so that can lead to sterility. It can also, these changes in the uh, meiosis can lead to disorders. A famous example of that is the Down syndrome. And so this would be a karyotype or, a, or a, uh, a picture of all the chromosomes in an individual. In this case, it'd be a female because there are two X chromosomes. But if you look at here with an individual as Down syndrome, you'll notice that they actually had uh, three 21st chromosomes. Now, what does that lead to? Um, a lot of the characteristics of a person who has Down syndrome, uh, development's going to be slowed. Um, sometimes they'll have a problem with speech. And, and the reason why is that a lot of those things are linked to proteins that are on the 21st chromosome. It's not a disorder. If you know somebody who has Down syndrome, uh, they live a really normal life, and they can be some of the best people you'll ever meet. Um, but mistakes in this can eventually lead to uh, genetic on this map right here, I'm showing how natural selection is actually played out. And so at the beginning, remember, I was talking about hemoglobin and how sickle cell anemia um, can lead to awful things. The neat thing that it can lead to is also the ability to not get malaria. And so this map on the left side is where malarial mosquitoes are found. On the right side, it shows the incidence of sickle cell anemia. And so we're going to find uh, higher rates of sickle cell an anemia in especially sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason why is that it created uh, sickle cell anemia, which was bad, but the beneficial mutation has allowed them not to get malaria, which is a huge selective pressure in Africa. And so that's genotypes, uh, that's phenotypes, and I hope that's helpful.